Making the videos that I do, I spend a lot of my time looking at mods for the Fallout games. Some look good, some look bad, a lot are really really bad at advertising exactly what they are or what they're doing. Most however, just look like more Fallout, like a DLC or an add-on for the base games. Very few choose to do something new, and even fewer do that something new well. Olympus 2207 is a total conversion mod for Fallout 2 that does something new and does a pretty good job at it to boot. Let's take a deep dive into this diesel punk total conversion to see what we can learn about Fallout, game design, and what makes modding such a unique and interesting field. This video was sponsored by nobody, yet. If you'd like to change that, I've now opened a Patreon. More on that at the end of the video. Olympus is a unique mod in the Fallout 2 modding space in that it's actually not meant to take place in the Fallout universe at all. The previous Fallout mods we've looked at have all meant to exist within the universe, either expanding the world and story established in the proper games, or doing something cool and unique with them. This is actually not the case for Olympus. It looks like Fallout, for the most part it plays like Fallout, but it's set in its own universe with its own stories, lore, and characters. A common thread in this mod is risk taking in game design. A lot of things in this mod seem very risky from the outset. This is a really good example of that. If people are playing a mod for Fallout 2, clearly they must already love the world of Fallout 2, so a safe choice for modders would be to use the world that the fans already love. Likely for originality's sake, the developers of this mod have chosen to stray from the safe path. Kind of, let me explain. The game opens with a really impressive cinematic that details the basics of the world and setting. Before the apocalypse, very rich people, we meet again, Jeffrey, built a mega skyscraper, and you are a servant living in their basement doing slave labor. A lot of things in this mod kind of act as parallels to things in the Fallout universe. In this instance, this basement functions identically to a vault. Underground area, mostly safe from the wasteland, exploitation by rich people, it really is all there. The world of Olympus 2207 really does model the story trope where a time traveler goes back in time and accidentally steps on a bug, and then goes back to their regular point in history, but this go around everything is different but still familiar. Familiar. Speaking of familiar, if there was one thing that you could use that word to describe perfectly, it would be this game's music. All of it is excellent, and the closest I think I've heard to an emulation of Mark Morgan's style. Here are a few snippets. Anyway, uh, you are a not vault dweller in a not vault that is controlled by not vault tech after the not great war. Here is where we do character creation and as usual there are preset characters or you can build your own if you're, you know, um, sane and normal. The character creation has a lot of really interesting ideas baked in there. One of the new traits is an overhaul of the way the entire skill system works, which is rad as hell. If you take this trait, the leveling system turns into a usage-based system similar to the Elder Scrolls, where your skills improve as you use them. To be honest with you, I never really liked the leveling system in the Elder Scrolls. It really enables grinding, even in some instances requires it, a lot more than even typical RPG leveling does. Real ones remember spamming Muffle in Skyrim over and over, or crafting 6,000 iron daggers. Usage-based systems are one of those things that sound really cool in concept, 
concept and sound really immersive, but actually kind of end up making the game even more gamey to me. A lot of people really do like the way that system works in those games though, and that's fine. I'm glad they experimented with the formula of classic Fallout in such a way as to include those people. Even if the outcome isn't exactly for me, the fact that they managed to make such a new system which works within the confines of Fallout 2 on its own is undoubtedly really impressive. A very important word that people tend to throw around when praising classic Fallout or other CRPGs is choice. One of the big reasons why people are still stuck on these games 20 plus years later is that you can build your character to be almost anyone. Olympus generally succeeds in following this trend. Unless you wanted to play as a woman of course. That's off the table entirely. Instead of picking a gender, you're forced to play as a man, and you have the choice of playing as a black or a white man. From what I've heard, black characters get access to a couple quests which white characters don't, but I have nothing to back that information up beyond the hearsay. What has always made choice in these games special is that classic Fallout and other CRPGs tend to react to your choices and allow you to play as the character you built, rather than having to brute force square peg round hole your character into the established gameplay and narrative. Usually this means having several ways of accomplishing quests that fit a variety of characters, as well as having alternative dialogue checks for instance. Olympus does all of this, but takes it one step further Further with a new system called archetypes. In the most simple terms, these archetypes function almost as character classes. Once you pick your special stats, the game will assign you one of these archetypes, and the sick part about this is that archetypes impact the dialogue choices you get and the way that characters react to you. Even cooler is that when I say dialogue choices, I don't mean if you have high charisma you get high charisma speech checks. What I mean is that even some of the basic lines change how you say hello to people. If you put lots of points into strength, your character will talk with their chest out, whereas a more scrawny, intelligent character will use more big words and technical knowledge when interacting with people in the wasteland. This is such a brilliant system that I'm honestly shocked the developers didn't advertise more. It's brilliant for two reasons. First, it makes sense. An extremely intelligent, skinny bookworm in real life typically would talk very different from a world-class athlete with no formal education. These two people would have such different ways of seeing and experiencing the world that, of course, their lines would be different. Second, it's great because it's yet another incentive to replay the game. Not only will a replay allow you to see new quest endings, but now, to see new quest beginnings. This system isn't perfect, of course. It doesn't telegraph itself very well at the beginning, and it's likely that a lot of players who went into the mod only played it once and don't even know that this system existed at all. I sure didn't. It took me trying a new character to figure out that it was even there. It also doesn't nearly go far enough, in my opinion. In an ideal RPG, a system like this would open entirely new quests or characters depending on their archetype and how people see them and trust them and everything like that, but that is an exceptionally ambitious ask to make. What's there is ambitious already. I'm not going to sit here complaining that they didn't do everything they possibly could have with it in their debut. There is so much to talk about here, and we haven't really even got into the story or gameplay. Should probably get on that or something. I don't know. Maybe we could just talk about character creation for 40 minutes. Not today. One day. Not today. The plot setup is as follows. You've lived your entire life in Tartarus, which is not a vault, as a slave for the gods of Olympus, who are not Valtek. Your father becomes quite suddenly and dramatically ill, and you have to get medicine to save him, but in the process of doing an errand for a guard, you are accused of the guard's murder, and you have to flee the underground. Leaving your home because something dramatic and or tragic happens to a family member. Man, I really wish these developers were as ambitious with their writing as they are with the leveling system. You have to exit your shelter to save your family is a trope that's been present now in Fallout 1, 3, and 4. If you want to stretch your definitions on shelter and family, this might even technically apply to Fallout 2 and 76 respectively. I'm done with it at this point. The intro of the game is excellent. It gives you a ton of insight into the world of the game and who your character is within it. It introduces the mythology surrounding Olympus and the gods that rule above it, and it introduces almost all of the major gameplay mechanics, from dialogue to combat to skill usage and so on. I would go as far as to say that the intro to Olympus is better than both Fallout 1 and 2 at introducing its mechanics to new players. In addition to that, it is entirely skippable. If you 
so choose, at the beginning of the playthrough, you can skip directly to the inciting incident where your dad gets sick and you get accused of killing the guard. The problem isn't that it's so long or that its writing is bad, although there is a kernel of truth in both of those claims, it's that they spend so much time on solving bully problems for your little brother, or carrying water buckets for your daily labor, but almost no time developing this inciting incident which is so important. The intro as a whole, if you take your time and do everything you possibly can, might take more than an hour to complete, but the stuff that forces you to leave Tartarus occurs in a matter of maybe two minutes. You come to get used to the slower, more detailed pace in the early intro, and then once you're done all of your side missions and you've looted all of the bookshelves, bang, your dad's sick, bang, no medicine, bang, guard is dead, and suddenly you're being chased out of the exit without any real time to process any of it. It's not just poor pacing, it's poor pacing twice over. It goes way too slow, and then it ends way too fast. Thankfully, during and after this section, you get these fantastic cutscenes. I talked about this in one of my prior videos, but it really is fantastic what can be done in these engines with modern technology. Once you're out in the world, you start to realize that this wasteland is in many ways similar and in many ways different to the one you know. I think the thing I appreciate the most about Olympus 2207 as a project is how they made the wasteland feel. Fallout 1's wasteland is dreary and empty and some sometimes dark, and that's one of the best things about it. You really do get the sense that this is a world blasted to hell. There were people here once, and there was life and love and civilization, but all of that's gone because of the very people who once lived in it. It's all ghosts now. If in Fallout 1 you were exploring a world of ghosts, exploring Olympus's map is exploring a world of, what's the word for an angry ghost? Is that thing a uh, mogwai? The world is much more actively violent is what I mean. Olympus does a really good job at making the wasteland a constantly actively hostile place. Sorry, did I say wasteland? I mean a radius. They call it the radius. Do you get it? Radius, like, like in math, like a circle around the tower. Also, radius, like radiation, do you get it? I can explain it to you if you don't get it, I just want to make sure you got it. Radiation and radiation sickness is something that's dealt with very infrequently in the Fallout games. In Fallout 1, the only memorable time I can remember it mattering was in the glow. Fallout 2 had the Rad Cave, 3 had the section with Fox where you grab the Gek, New Vegas had Camp Searchlight, 4 had the Glowing Sea. Every Fallout game typically has its one or two tough areas where radiation comes up, but other than that, it's largely an afterthought. It's there, for sure, and you see its impact on the world, but it's not life-threatening outside of radiation sections. The entire game of Olympus 2207 is a life-threatening radiation section. If you want to go anywhere in Olympus or do anything, you will have to take radiation into account. If you don't, it will kill you, and it will kill you fast. You died. Within a week, almost everyone forgot about you. Wait a goddamn minute, I know you. What the hell are you doing here? Everywhere I go, I see his... Antlers. It actually might have been misleading for me to say it would kill you fast. It actually does something much worse. If you stay radiated for long enough, your special attributes will deteriorate permanently over time. You heard me right. If you are severely radiated for a while, your special attributes go down and there is no way to reverse this, unlike the originals where it was completely reversible no matter how long you were radiated for. I probably don't even have to explain why this is such a cool change. It forces your hand, you deal with your radiation or the game becomes basically unplayable and then you die and you have to revert to a save where all of your stats are garbage. Radiation is ever present and more dangerous than in any of the Fallout games. This is pretty definitively my favorite mechanic in Olympus, and one that I would change nothing about. By all metrics, they nailed it. Aside from mechanics that increase difficulty, Olympus also comes with crafting mechanics that are a little more intuitive than the ones in Fallout Nevada. But what I said about those mechanics in my video on it equally applies here. The major issue with crafting is a major issue with many of the new features in this game. It's slightly undercooked. A big wasted opportunity with crafting that I was waiting for the game to bring up was batteries. This is actually a critique that the death narrator guy made over on his channel, but I'll repeat and elaborate. Instead of the central currency of the game being bottle caps, the radius uses batteries. Batteries are used for a whole lot of things in real life. Walkie-talkies, robots, machines of all kinds. In the universe of Olympus, energy weapons use a kind of battery, but the batteries in Olympus are only useful as currency. I was waiting for an opportunity for the crafting menu to allow for charged batteries, or something else 
impulse that turns batteries into something useful outside of trading. With energy weapons, it would even allow for a really cool trade-off. In order to use those guns, you would literally have to spend money to fire them. It costs $400,000 to fire this weapon for 12 seconds. <laughs> but batteries in Olympus unfortunately carry no such use. Despite many instances requiring batteries, none require these batteries. It could have been handled much better. After leaving Tartarus, likely the first place you'll go is the metro station. The metro station is home to a variety of scavengers, many of which are also former residents of Tartarus. You can ask each of the ex-Tartarus people why and how they left, and they'll give you their story. There are a handful of characters here who, in classic video gamey fashion, hold information back until you do some task for them. Go kill some scorpions, find some apples, plunge our toilets. <sighs> RPG quest design, never change. That's not a recommendation, by the way. It's more like a like a diagnosis. Once you get to areas outside the metro, quest design gets a little better. Here we can begin talking about the dialogue and the writing. To summarize, eh, this is a pretty mixed bag. The three huge settlements in the game, not counting Olympus itself, which I guess functions as a fourth, are the Jackal Raider Settlement, the Rainbow Raider Settlement, and a town called New World Order. All of these areas are good in terms of aesthetic, and they all come with a variety of quests and vendors. But what shocked me the most was the quality disparity between the two raider settlements and New World Order. The two raider settlements have a couple pretty fairly well-written characters, but the majority in these areas felt unrealistic to me. Most of these characters don't really come across as people. They are, and they are portrayed as, bad guy NPCs. This problem to some extent persists in all Fallout games. Quote unquote evil characters are very hard to write. This is especially true of raiders, because the identity of being a raider is so tied up in violence and mania that more often than not writers will tunnel vision on that which means that their characters feel very one-dimensional. Most of the raider characters in the game spend all their lines insulting you which would be all right but another problem with the writing of these characters is that either the developers are really bad at writing insults or something got deeply lost in translation. A lot of the things they say to you vary from nonsensical to just straight up bizarre. For example, in the Rainbow Raiders bar, you get this. I'm going to make a meatball out of your innards and shove it very deep into your black ass, and she gets your black balls as a souvenir. <sighs> The original cut of this video involved a pretty long breakdown of why this interaction and some semi-related others are bad. That isn't here because this scene in particular deals with violent sexual abuse and it came to a point where I became genuinely uncomfortable reading the lines out loud. So instead of hearing that, you'll kind of have to just trust me that it's bad. I'll leave it at this. One of the most interesting parts of an apocalypse setting is that you're able to explore the darker, more morally corrupt aspects of humanity and the human condition with context. What separates good and bad post-apocalyptic fiction is that good apocalypse writing will have well-elaborated meanings and points to make through this exploration. By contrast, bad apocalypse fiction will drop the highest degrees of human depravity at your feet and then leave it at that. Folks, I don't know if you knew this, but it turns out humans can be bad sometimes. You're welcome. This is cut and dry bad writing. The poor writing in these areas doesn't ruin the experience of the raider locations necessarily. There's still lots of fun stuff to do, and these areas are very worthwhile insofar as they aid world building and have a lot of neat gameplay and role playing potential. A lot of these writing issues also can be applied to the characters in the metro, so at this point in my playthrough, the game had effectively tricked me into thinking it had across the board subpar writing. The thing is, after visiting both Rainbow Raiders and the Jackals, I had still not visited the New World Order. In retrospect, this was a massive mistake on my part because the writing in New World Order is very obviously the best in the game. It's not even close, actually. The New World Order is just a fairly regular town, so perhaps the devs were just a lot better at writing normal, non-scav, non-raider characters. There is genuinely so much to love in this area. I particularly love the main thing to do in the town, which is settling the political situation. You see, the mayor is going to be retiring soon, and if you don't intervene, his idiot son will become mayor and doom everybody. This kid really is an idiot, but he's a well-written idiot, which this mod doesn't have very many 
many of. In fact, almost all of them are in this one area. A big theme in New World Order is the clash between naive self-image and ugly reality. The kid is stupid, and he thinks very highly of himself and his plans, if you can even call him that. You're gonna blow up the town and then rebuild it as a settlement that only you and your cool friends are allowed into? That sounds great, kid. Let me know how that turns out. Out front, there's a scout who thinks extremely highly of his abilities, but who runs away immediately when you and he come across rats in a building you scavenge together. There is a quest which involves a feud between two brothers, one of whom is very egotistical and narcissistic, and you're tasked with bringing him down to earth a little and making him understand that the only real strength he has in this cruel world is the strength of his bond with family. The mayor's wife is very gossipy and image obsessed. Asking her opinion on matters will yield you takes that align directly with the worst outcomes. This is contrasted by the more down-to-earth characters in the town, the town's working men, or the mayor, or Sam, a fantastically written ghoul character. Sam might be the best written character in the mod, actually. He's exceptionally wise, written to be exactly the supernaturally old pragmatist that he ought to be after so much time in the wasteland. Sorry, Radius. You might be asking, why is it called the New World Order? I see no fluoride, and I thought that too, but Sam has a very succinct and hopeful explanation. Its name reflects all the main principles we follow. Firstly, order. We maintain peace here, ensured by our guards. Secondly, new. We are creating a new society where anyone could feel protected and confident in their future. Thirdly, world. Our ideas and principles go far beyond us. There are more and more people in other places who support our worldview. It is possible for us to become the center of a new world, and that's what we're aiming for. In the political quest, one of the options is actually to have Sam appointed as mayor. This pretty nicely wraps up the thematic conversation taking place all over the town's writing. Appearance isn't everything, and sometimes the best option isn't shiny. It might be worth it in a lot of cases to set aside ego and focus on what's best for everyone given the data, our objective experiences, and our collective situation. The major settlement affecting quests for the raiders are not nearly as developed or well written, and I don't even think the main quest is. There's one more settlement I want to mention before finishing the main quest, which is a vault. Not a not vault like our not vault, this is literally an actual doomsday vault. As with many of the people in the New World Order, a lot of these residents are very egotistical. The people in here view themselves as aristocracy, regardless of merit. Although related to NWO in theme, unless you view this vault as an extension of that place's story, which is honestly a stretch in my opinion, they don't do nearly as much with it. The area is still cool in their fun quests, but it just doesn't hit as hard as the New World Order stuff. Getting into the Olympus Tower pretty much follows the same formula as entering either of the two ending locations in Fallout 1. You can storm it violently or wear a specific garb that tricks people into thinking you work there. In case you forgot, the main quest of this game was actually to get medicine to help your dad. Honestly, while writing this script, I forgot too. It's okay, I forgive you. That being said though, we can joke, but one of the main features the website advertises is the lack of a main quest, and this is partially true. Not healing dad isn't a fail state like not getting the water chip in Fallout 1, although both are on a time limit. If dad dies before you get the medicine, life goes on. In fact, and this is kind of weird, dad dying is kind of a benefit gameplay wise, because if he does, you get your brother as a companion. If he lives, you get more XP, but no actual tangible reward. I digress though, once you're out of Tartarus, you can do whatever you want, and if that means avoiding Olympus and never coming back, that's fine. Through the New World Order, they've established a more than good enough story arc to work through. But if you don't go to Olympus, the game never has a specific endpoint, which leaves us lacking in closure. No answers, no ending slides, no cutscene. All of these do exist, however, which means that the claim that the game doesn't have a main quest is slightly misleading. More accurate would be to say that the game has a beginning quests and a series of ending quests, with the middle parts essentially left for you to figure out on your own. Once you're in the Olympus Tower, if you do choose to enter it, you learn about this place and the type of things they get up to here, all of which is your typical advanced technology bad faction activity. You know, there's arts and crafts, there's a Lego bucket in the corner, Tommy's picking his nose, you know, 
that's how it goes. You can even participate in a lot of this deeply evil activity, which is really good for that kind of character. One scientist is working on a cloning machine and tasks you with dragging a female Tartarus resident up to his lab so she can calibrate the machine. All you need to do is look just past the scientist to read between the lines as to what that really means. Quick complaints, this area and this group are far more incompetent than they should be. They run a slave arena with an impenetrable layer of propaganda, have patrols of heavily armored soldiers with tamed monsters, and then you get inside and it's like everyone here is an idiot. The scientists are obviously deranged and bad at their jobs, a lot of the quests revolve around petty personal beefs. Their members are immature, and people are far, far too willing to give you access to every restricted area around. For gameplay convenience reasons, this makes sense, but story-wise, it's a bit anachronistic with the way that this faction was characterized in the early and mid-game. Other than those complaints, I think this location is pretty well developed, atmospheric, and fun to work your way up. Eventually, after doing all those evil quests for the tower people, you come across a supercomputer who can give you a bunch of exposition about how the world ended and insights on the factions. A settlers group by the name of New World Order attempts to apply the principles of democracy to the life of their community. Note, the countries that initiated the bombings had reached the peak of democracy at the time. The recommended regime of the New World Order would be socialism. This computer tells you that the current tower administrator is losing his mind and that you have to kill him and take his place. The rationale behind killing the administrator is that the administrator is human and humans are fallible and unstable, but somehow you won't be, despite also being human. I don't really know. But that's the major split between endings. You take the reins of the Olympus Tower as its new god, or you don't, and you let the power die alongside its former administrator. But first, boss fight! Holy shit! This animation is awesome. It's very clear loads of work went into it. Gameplay-wise, I don't think it's very special, it's similar to the Masters boss fight in Fallout 1, minus the ability to beat it via speech, but the animations themselves almost make up for that. Once the administrator is dead, you make your choice, and Olympus 2207's main quest is over. You can keep playing if you choose to do so, and you finish off with a slideshow detailing how all your choices affected the various settlements in the radius, and how your ending choice affected Olympus. Olympus 2207 is, by a wide margin, the most unique of the mods we've covered so far. It takes a lot of gambles, from the world not being in the Fallout universe to the changes to gameplay, this team took a lot of risks. I can say pretty confidently that a majority of those risks paid off. The amount of sheer effort put in to make Olympus 2207 its own product, with its own music, textures, systems, and animations, created an experience wholly of its own. I think a lot of mods aren't taken seriously in the gaming space because typically they're immediately and directly tied to the games they're based on, and those games are typically superior to whatever modders can pull together with their tiny teams and budgets. If Olympus succeeded in one thing, it is that it, for a moment, made me forget that I was somehow playing anything that it was originally Fallout. It's unique to a degree that I don't think I've really ever seen in a mod. This is its own game, and the game is pretty damn solid. The writing at times is questionable, and there were a lot of things I wish they expanded upon that they didn't, but this is a seriously impressive and solid project despite all of those shortcomings. I'll leave a link to a couple other videos on the mod if you want to check it out, as well as the mod itself. I'd like to take this moment on the back end of the video to plug my Patreon. Oh, oh, come on. Stop, stop, stop. Don't look at me like that. You knew it was coming. I'm a full-time student at university, and on top of that, I have a part-time day job, so the amount of time I have to work on videos is pretty limited. This is why videos only come out every few months. Making more money on videos would mean that I would need to spend less time making money at my real job, and in turn, would mean that I can spend more time working on stuff for you guys. If you care about my work and want to contribute, I'll leave a link in the description for you. Payment is set to be on a per video basis rather than every month. Even with a handful of patrons, I still don't think I could guarantee a video a month, and I don't want to be charging people during months that I don't make content. Anyway, like I said, if you're interested, the link is down there. I appreciate all of you more than you will ever know. I have a big old list of videos to work on, including many more Fallout mods, so I'm gonna go get on that now. Thanks again.